What's going down, DGens? Back again for week nine. We are back on a big screen, not filming this on my phone because I'm not a complete loser all the time. But let's get into it. I gotta make this one kind of quick because there's a bunch of shit I gotta do that I don't want to do, but I gotta do. Uh, so yeah, it's not football related either. So it's like really shitty. But anyways, uh, let's start off with a recap on the bottom left hand screen. Bottom left hand side of your screen, if I could remember how to talk, you're gonna see a, a, an agenda for today, right? Got to be organized. This is how we get ahead in life. Honestly, I don't know how you get ahead in life. I'm not there yet. So, uh, agenda though, we're gonna recap, go over the week nine picks. Uh, if that's all you're here for, you can get the fuck out after that. Uh, if you want more and you want to get the insights and the details and all the nitty gritty stuff that I like because I'm a loser, um, you're gonna, you know, want to stick around for the rest of it. If you're a nerd like me, we'll get into some of the style team updates, the over under teams, the teaser teams, all that kind of stuff. The DVOA updates, uh, the updated grades basically, and the expected points and all that kind of stuff. And I'll just show you a little bit of how accurate that's been because, as I said earlier in the season, that's going to get more and more accurate as the year goes on. Uh, then we're going to go, well, we'll go over the why it's still, still a teaser week like it was last week. And then lastly, uh, we do have an update on the three game homestand. Uh, data that we're tracking that apparently nobody else is tracking because I don't know they just they just don't give a shit so anyways I'm the only one that loves you remember that subscribe like comment and uh, you know send money if you want to or whatever but the recap for week eight so this is uh, the the worst week we've had as far as just straight picks right when I say straight picks I mean sides and totals um, the record for the sides and totals was o oh, two and one um, the two, you know, sides that we had, we had the Rams and Cowboys under 46. I'm sorry, the, the total that we had was the Rams and uh, Cowboys under 46. That fucking sailed over. That was just a bad look. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's the way it goes now. It went, I think it got to like 63 points or something like that. But a lot of that was the Cowboys defense. My God, they were just beating the hell out of the Rams. And then, I mean, it got to the point where Stafford just, you know, he just wasn't coming back in after that dumb injury. And so that eh, that sucks, but you know, wrong wrong pick, wrong side. I think, as far as totals are concerned, um, and and you guys comment below if if you agree with me or if you, if what you think on this one because I'm actually curious. I don't want to play the Cowboys totals anymore. Um, I think that they are very unpredictable, and the reason I'm thinking that is because of defensive scores. Their defense is so good that the game could be, you know, under, and it could be like a 10 to 17 kind of game every single week. The thing is that the defense is so good that they get turnovers, they get, you know, pick sixes, they, they get short fields and all that kind of stuff. And that is the weeks that they go over. And so it just seems like I'm always on the wrong side because I'm thinking like, oh, this team should be good. You know, they should uh, be able to at least kind of keep the Cowboys defense honest and not have a bunch of turn turnovers and stuff. But it happens, you know, that's, that's very, very hard to predict. Uh, and then when they do get the turnovers, like I said, that, that may be seven, 10, 14, 17, 20 points in some of these games that the defense is putting up by themselves. Um, and then you have another like 17 points that the Cowboys offense is going to put up. And that's probably the predictable part. Um, but the Cowboys and even the Browns to a certain extent, it's like, you know, it's hard to really play their totals because the defense may score so much on their own and that's not really accounted for in most people's totals um but anyways we, we lose on that one uh ravens minus seven versus the cardinals this is the one that pissed me off because the ravens are up i believe it was 21 to 7 uh at the beginning of the fourth quarter or something like that um up by two scores easily and they they go ahead and score again they're up they're gonna win it's it's not in doubt the Cardinals score 17 points in the fourth fucking quarter. And the reason that that pissed me off, number one, they had, only, they had scored one touchdown. Okay, cool, whatever. We'll give them that. The second touchdown that they score in the fourth quarter, though, it's like three minutes or less than three minutes left in the game. Tight end catches the ball at like the five. He's trying to push the pile. It, the Ravens have him. They're, they're, they're all over him. They're, they're holding him. They're going to take him down. But it's going on and on and on. And it's to the point where it's like, okay, if I'm a defensive player, 
did I not hear the whistle? I don't want to throw this guy down because then I'm going to get the flag for, for hitting him after the whistle. Like, what's going on? Why is it taking so long? And if you go back and watch the replay, the, the defensive players, it's like two or three of them from the Ravens that are looking around at the refs like, what the fuck? Like, are we not going to blow the whistle? We, we've got him here for like 10 minutes already. What, what's going on? And they're just allowing it to keep going on. And it, it was so bad that even the announcers were like, you got to blow that whistle. Uh, you know, mainly because you're putting the defense in a bad spot and you're going to get this guy hurt because if he gets thrown down because you haven't blown the whistle, he could get hurt. And the next time, if you are continuing to not blow the whistle, the defense is going to come and get him a late hit because they, they know that they have to get him on the ground. So that was a that was a pain in the ass. But they get that score. They go for two to make it an eight-point game. They don't get it. So it's a ten-point game with like less than two minutes left to go in the game. I'm watching the game. I'm thinking, okay, cool, good. My seven is good. I'm glad I got the seven. I'm glad I didn't get the eight or the eight and a half or the nine and a half that we got later on. Um, so cool, awesome, right? No, the onside kick goes perfect. Onside kick. Nelson Aguilar can't handle it. The damn Cardinals get the ball back on like the forty. They get into field goal position, and they spike it with like twenty six seconds left. They get the field goal. They get to exactly seven. And then, of course, they don't get the, the, the second onside kick, right? And the, the Ravens just kneel it out. But, oh, my God. Just annoyed the shit out of me that you had the, the shitty whistle. You are able to stop them on a two-point conversion. And then you can't get the onside kick. Then you still let them get into field goal range and get the next field goal to knock it down to seven. It, it was just like a, this whole chain of events that happened in like a three-minute game span. And what really pissed me off on all that is had they hit, had they actually gotten that two-point conversion from the first touchdown that they maybe shouldn't have gotten when they got it, had they gotten a two-point conversion and it's an eight-point game, they don't even go for the kick. You know, At that point, there's no point in the kick. They're just going to try to get the, the touchdown, and they probably don't get the touchdown. We probably get the cover. So I, I really specifically remember, and we can go back and play the tape, but I remember saying, buy it down to seven because there's a, a backdoor opportunity for the Cardinals, and this is the bullshit I was talking about. So... I'm glad we got the seven. I'm glad that we got the push and it wasn't another loss. But it really pissed me off. Like, I was heated after that game just because of that shit. Um, but whatever. We get the push on that one. And then the other one was the Texans over 23 and a half. And that was a late ad if you didn't see it on the first video. It was like on the Friday video. Um, they just, that, the offense just didn't look good. They just could not, you know, get anything going. Um, you know, just bad look on that side. I really did think that the Panthers defense was going to allow a little bit more functionality from the Texans, but didn't come through. Uh, you know, algorithm was off on that one. So that, yeah, again, another loss, right? So against O two and one, as far as just the straight up picks. However, I also said last week that last week and from week eight through week 13 is going to be heavy teaser weeks because the lines are so sharp and you can see that with the push. Right, just very, very sharp lines for the next couple weeks here, guys. The middle of the season is always the sharpest part of the season. Uh, so if you're trying to play sides and totals by itself, you can do it, especially if you have an algorithm, especially if you're keeping track of everything and you're keeping the data analysis and all the other stuff, just like I've been doing, just like I've been showing you. We can do it. We can win. We're going to get there. Uh, the problem is if you're not doing that and you're just focused on one, two, or three teams, it is a very, very difficult time of the season because the lines are so sharp. Everybody has all their data. They have all the algorithms. Sample size is big enough. Uh, you know, bookies as well as bookmakers as well as you know, big time uh, betters like high money. They they all have what they need, so they're going to make this line super, super sharp. Take the value out early, and you're going to be left kind of holding the shit into the bag. The the good thing with that, when the lines are super, super sharp. That's when you want to do a teaser. That's when those six points are most valuable because now you're moving through key numbers and you're moving through key numbers off of an already sharp line. So if the line really should be, you know, whoever minus six or plus six, and now you're going to get the extra six points to make that line not so sharp and you're going to get through the seven and the ten, well, hell, good, awesome. Or you're going to tease it down you're going to get through the three. So... Again, just a really good time to tease. I, I can't stress that enough. If you're looking for some plays, and there's, there's, I would say, about eight lines here or eight picks that I could give you as far as teaser legs that 
meet all the requirements of my algorithm and are going to get you through key numbers, whether it's on the sides or the totals. Um, but I kind of had to narrow it down. I'm trying to condense it to just the plays I'm really, really loving. Um, and so I'm going to go again with two teasers this week, but I'll show you. We're going to recap the ones from last week, first of all. So that's what saved us for the week is the teasers, as I expected. Uh, both of them hit. So we have Eagles minus a half a point. That one hit. Um, if you'd gotten the Eagles at six and a half, you would have cashed just the straight up line. But if you had Eagles minus seven, which is a later line, you got a push. Um, Lions minus three. That one cashed no issues. Uh, they end up winning by 12. So even if you had taken the Lions minus nine or the Lions minus seven, um, you would have cashed either way. So we got, we maybe didn't need that depending on what time you got it. But either way, we get it. We get the, the sweat free win with that teaser. The next one here is the Titans plus eight and a half uh, with the Bears Chargers over over 40 and a half. Now the Titans uh, actually just outright won the game. So that was good. You could have just gotten the Titans plus the two and a half. But again, uh, pretty sharp line still within like four points uh, bears chargers over 40 and a half we didn't need the teaser on this particular line because it was at 46 the final total ends at 43 so if you took the over um initially in this one you, you didn't get the win on this one unfortunately it was just an outright loss um, but you did get the win with the teasing so get the over 40 and a half and it was like a late cover too because they, they were i was really sweating that last one there uh on the monday night game they scored with like three minutes left and just some bullshit touchdown that didn't matter but it got us the over so we get that um again all of these lines the lions again if you had gotten them at minus nine the game ended at 12 so you were again a field goal away uh the eagles from six and a half or seven, they won by exactly seven. The Titans plus the two and a half, or the I know a lot of people, pretty much everybody I know that's betting was on the Falcons, except for myself. Um, and then obviously that didn't take place. And I even put out a little tweet there on I think Sunday morning showing why the Titans had the edge in that game. But either way, we get the covers with those. So we go two, two, and one for the week, including the teasers. Um, the size and totals performance for the year goes to 20, 12, and 1. We're still up 6.8 units, so that's great. Uh, teasers finally increased to 3 and 5. Not great, but we're getting there, and this is, again, hopefully the better time of year for the teasers. Uh, let's go over those first for week 9. Bucks Texans under 46. Uh, currently, that line is at 40, so obviously we're going to tease that uh, to under 46. Both of these teams like to play slow. Both of these teams like to run. Both of these teams are not uh, the type of team to go ahead, you know, to run up the score if they don't need to. They're going to just play what they have to. Um, the Bucks' offense has looked just god awful with Baker Mayfield. Yeah, they got the late cover last week, uh, or the late touchdown, I should say, last week. But oh my god, that was just so ugly. And even that, even when they finally said, you know what, let it rip, Baker. Just you know, we're down two scores. Go ahead and do what you're going to do. The touchdown that Mike Evans scored, first of all, they needed two penalties on fourth downs to to push the drive. Um, and then lastly, the touchdown is a fucking pass that bounces off someone's helmet and just happens to land in his hands. It's ugly, dude. That, that Buccaneers team, I wouldn't be surprised if they end up averaging like 14 points a game <clears throat> by the end of the year. The Texans, um, they they can look better. But they're another team who they're not going to put up points unless they need to. If, if they're winning by 14, 17 points, they're not going to put up anything extra. They're going to just try to run the clock out. Even if it's like the second or third quarter, they're just going to go as conservative as they can and kind of protect their quarterback, um, get the hell out of there. Uh, Titans plus nine at Steelers is the second leg of that teaser. Uh, Titans actually looked really good with Will Levis. Um, and I don't think that the line has accounted for that just yet now. Keep in mind that they were playing the Falcons, and the Falcons' secondary is not the best. But give me the plus nine. The Steelers, as a favorite, um, not so good. And as far as teasing against them as a favorite, I believe it's 4-0 or 3-0. and and You know what? Let's just see what the hell it is. But either way, um, not great numbers as far as the Steelers are concerned. Uh, definitely a good spot to tease them or tease against them is when they are listed as a as a favorite. Uh, second teaser is going to be Vikings Falcons under 44. Now both of these teams again like to play it slow. Obviously I just talked about that with the Falcons. Now the Falcons had actually been putting up some points recently um, but a lot of that is because they're playing against other teams that were forcing them to move the ball, put up points, all that kind of stuff. Um 
they don't typically like to do that. They like to run the ball. Now, they did just change uh, – I don't want to say trade out, but they, they kind of upgraded, in my opinion, to Tyler Heineke as a starting quarterback. Now, who knows if he's going to start again because this was kind of like a mid-game decision to take Ritter out even after he cleared a concussion protocol. Uh, but Heineke just seems more willing to pass the ball downfield. Now, keep in mind – when Heineke comes in the game, they're down by two scores. So I don't think there was any doubt about him having to pass the ball. Um, But I think that in a neutral game script, he may, and he's definitely a better passer than Ritter. Now, I don't know how much better he's going to look because that offensive line was just getting demolished last week. I mean, Ritter just taking hit after hit after hit. That's why he was got out of the game to to begin with, right? He took a a shot to the, really to the head uh, right at the end of the second quarter there. So I don't know how how good he's going to look, uh, but I do know that he's at least a better passer. I just think that in general, the Falcons are a slow team. Arthur Smith wants to run the ball. The Vikings have not been putting up a lot of points in general. They've had mostly unders this year. I believe they're like six and two to the under. I'm sorry, six and one to the under, something like that. Um, and I'll pull it up here in just a second. I just don't want to get off the page just yet. Um, the Vikings, on the other hand, though, they just lost Kirk Cousins. They are talking about bringing an, another quarterback in, a veteran quarterback. But last week, when Kirk Cousins went out, they allowed the backup to throw like four passes, and he was like three for four at 25 yards. Not super impressive. Um, I don't think they're going to ask him to do too much if he is, in fact, the starter. I think they're going to try to just get, get out with you know, as minimal passing as possible. Um, if they do pass, I really, truly expect a lot of underneath stuff, uh, a lot of just, hey, give it to, you know, give give us a four or five yard pass and then we'll let us do the rest as far as like the receivers are concerned. Uh, try to get a lot of yak after that. But it's going to be a slower paced game. Um, just the way these two teams like to play as well as the backup to Kirk Cousins being in there. Um, and especially if Ritter's in there, he's just, ugh, the guy is terrible as far as like deep downfield passes. Watching that game last week, Every single time someone was open downfield, he's airmailing it by like 10 yards over them. It's It's got awful to watch. Um, the second leg of that, though, is going to be Commanders plus 9.5 versus the Patriots. Uh, Commanders are 5-3 and three when you tease with them. Uh, the Patriots are 7-1 and one when you tease against them. Um, now, when you're teasing against them as a favorite, it's, it's even that much better, right? But 7-1 and one teasing against them. Now, I will say in... You know, all fairness here, the Commanders are also seven and one when you tease against them. Uh, the problem is the Patriots are the favorites, so you're not going to really get anything. You're going to get to plus three if you tease them through. You know, you're going to tease them through the zero first of all, and then you're only going to get to the plus three. Whereas the Commanders, you're going to get the plus nine and a half. Now the Patriots, just so you know, my algorithm has them expected for about thirteen points a game. Their points per game right now is about fourteen points, and it looks like I believe the highest mark that they've had is seventeen points. Basically, if the Commanders can score a touchdown, if they can get to seven in this game, which I fully expect them to do so, they should cover this nine and a half. Um, Now, on top of that, the Patriots, every game that they've won so far this year has been a one score possession game. And we're going to get back to that as well. Uh, But again, give me the Commanders plus nine and a half. Even if they lose this game, it's going to be a one score game. Regardless of whether they win or lose, I don't see the Patriots putting up more than 17 points in this game. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much all we need for that one. So, Commanders plus 9.5 on that second leg of the teaser. So, those are the teasers. Um, as far as the straight picks here, we have three of them. Now, this first one is going to be a new segment we're introducing called the Purple Pick of the Week. Purple Pick is teams that I have been right as far as projecting their totals right their, their overall score or their output for at least three weeks in a row so the algorithm has spit out accurate numbers for these teams for at least three weeks now that's not to say it's going to continue forever because there's always a damn outliers that'll throw us off but it's the best shot we have at being able to know that we're projected uh, accurately projecting the totals for these two teams the giants and the raiders both meet that criteria um storyboard has in them way way down uh we'll get into the totals here in just a second but under 38 and a half is the pick the algorithm has been very very good at projecting both of those teams both those teams like to play slow who knows who's going to be the quarterback for the giants even if it is daniel jones i'm not seeing much upgrade in there if any raiders again they play slow unless you absolutely make them try to pass the ball and even then 
not great, um, whether that's coaching or Jimmy G or whatever. Either way, it's just not a great look for them. They're not going to put up too many points unless they just have a really outlier week in a really unique situation, and I don't think the Giants are going to force them to get there. Uh, Ravens minus 5.5 versus the Seahawks. All of my projections and all of my algorithms and outputs and stats and all that kind of stuff have the Ravens as the number one team in the NFL right now. And even with the eye test, they look to be just the most impressive, most consistent team out there. Now, they did mess up earlier in the season, especially against that Steelers game. I cannot get out of my head. Um, This past week, again, just the ball bounces funny, and they don't get the cover. They get the push. But asking them to just basically win by a touchdown here in the Seahawks game uh, in a a dead number, which is the 5.5, give me that all day. And the Seahawks, while I do think that they are a good team, I think they are a little bit of a paper tiger there uh and we'll go over some of the stats here in just a second they kind of read that out and then the last pick we have is the colts minus two and a half versus the panthers or at the panthers uh the panthers last week do win really good spot for them coming off a of bye week both teams are coming off a of bye week uh but the the first chance they really had to, to instill a bunch of different changes and, and new updates and new plays and for Frank Reich to work with his young quarterback throughout the off you know off week all that kind of stuff great week um they're still only able to put up 15 points and that's a concern because usually rookie quarterbacks coming off a of bye week and those teams coming off a of bye week they put up pretty big numbers um and they go over the total like 60 something percent of the time the fact that he was only able to put up 15 is a real concern. Now the Colts are, I believe, six and two to the over this year, and the two um, unders were games that Minshew had to come in and start, kind of without being prepared for that. I think this game it could be another over if you really wanted to look at the total. But the the fact is, the Colts can put up points. They have put up points. They have a relatively decent offense. Uh, they're involved in a lot of high scoring games, and if the game flow goes that way. I don't believe the Panthers can keep up. They can put up some points on the board. They can move the ball. But if you're asking them to put up, you know, 28 plus points, I don't think Bryce Young is ready to do that. Um, as 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 well as all of that, the algorithm also has the Colts win in this game pretty handily, covering the two and a half. And the Colts and the Panthers are both teams that we picked or um, projected correctly for at least one to two weeks here. And that's most likely, or that is really why I chose this. these two teams. It's one of the two teams, one of the matchups where both teams have been projected relatively frequently uh, with some pretty good accuracy by the algorithm. So those are the three, uh, the three straight up picks. Let's go to the style teams, just so I can show you what we're talking about with the teasing and unders and all that kind of crap. So teasers, Raiders with the loss last night, they move to 8-0 when you tease against them. They literally, you have not lost. If you've teased against the Raiders every single week, you have not lost. So look to tease against the Raiders when possible. Obviously, when it makes sense, don't do it just for the hell of it. Um, Eagles are 7-1 and when you tease with them. Again, we teased with them last week with the Commanders, so that's good. Uh, Washington, like I was just saying, 7-1 and when you tease against them. 3-0 and when you tease against them as a favorite, and 5-3 and when teasing with them. So really not a bad teaser team one way or the other, but the Patriots 7-1 and when you tease against them. So we're going to combine the 7-1 and Patriots when you tease against them with the 5-3 and Washington uh, team you know, when you tease with them, plus we're going to get the key numbers of the 3, the 6, the 7. So we're going to take Washington and tease them up this week. Vikings seven and one when you tease with them. Now this could be changing because of the Kirk Cousins issue. Uh, four and one when you tease against them as a favorite. So if they're favorites, you do want to tease against them. I just don't know how many times we're going to see that this year. The Falcons are seven and one when you tease against them. The only team that could not cover when teased against the Falcons uh, was the Panthers in Week One. And Bryce Young's first start. The Rams six and two. Obviously they get their ass handed to them by the Cowboys this last week. Chargers are 7-1 and one when you tease with them. So really, really strong trend there to tease with the... I'm sorry, 6-1 and because they had the damn bye week. So 6-1 and one with the Chargers um, when you're teasing with them. So that's always good. And just kind of a good trend to keep in mind because they do play a lot of closer games. The Saints are 6-2 and two when you tease against them. Now the Giants are 5-3 and three overall. 
At one point, they were 1-3 and three when you teased with them. But the books have moved so much on the Giants because they have looked just so terrible that they are actually 4-0 and oh when you tease with them since October 8th. So ever since the books have given more and more points to the Giants because nobody wants to bet on this team, when you tease with them, you're 4-0. and oh. So if you wanted to tease with them this week against the Raiders in a game where we're expecting very little scoring, I would say it's a pretty plus EV move to do. Now, I'm not currently doing that but it's a pretty good look uh texans are four two and one uh when you just overall but when you tease them as a dog they are uh i believe it's four and one actually it's either three and one or four and one but they have not lost you a game as a dog when you tease them steelers are four and three just on the year being teased they are two and oh when you tease against them as a favorite so again uh, teasing them as a favorite or teasing against them as a favorite has been very, very plus EV. Uh, and we're going to do that this week with the Titans. They're going to take the Titans up to the plus nine in a game where I think the Titans could just outright win that game, especially if Will Levis is going to continue shooting the ball downfield. Um, you know, even if with the Steelers improved defense compared to the Falcons from last week, the fact that he's willing to just try it is going to definitely make them be play a little bit differently against this Titans team. Unders for the week uh, are unders for the season. Giants are 7 and 1 to the under, Bucks are 7 and 1, Chiefs are 7 and 1, Vikings 6 and 1, Steelers 6 and 1. These are all under teams, guys. Uh take a look at this. I can't go over every single team, but just keep a look uh at, at these under teams. Saints are 6 and 2, Falcons 6 and 2, uh Raiders 6 and 2. These teams just play really, really slow, and any chance that we get to where we can put two of these under teams together, we're definitely going to do that. And so we have that this week with the Giants, uh, seven and one to the under, and then the Raiders six and two to the under. Give me the under thirty-eight and a half in that game. I believe that line is moving down already, though, so you're going to want to get that as soon as possible. Uh, let's see who else is here. Yeah, Patriots five and two, I guess. Uh, yeah, so the. the just take a look at this guys basically if you ever see two of these teams playing against each other take the under it's not that hard it's not it's not a hard handicap uh over teams dolphins colts and bears are all six and two to the over so there's not many over teams this year as you know the points have been down in the nfl uh, but for all three of these teams they've been pretty good as far as moving the ball as well as having kind of shittier defenses that allow other teams to also move the ball uh so if you see these two teams playing against each other, if you see these two teams playing against a team that at least has a competent to above average offense, look to the over. Um, but it does take two teams, so you can't just take them against, like, you know, the Falcons, right? Because they, they may just get pushed down to the under because the other team isn't willing to keep up their end of the bargain there. Um, let's take a look at projections. So we did have a couple of these games. We had one, two, three, four of these games that we projected last week. They were all very, very close within four points on both sides. So, like, the Patriots offense game, the projected score was 17-35. to 35. The final score was 17-31. Uh, Giants-Jets projected score was 13-9. Final score was 10-13. to 13. Very, very close. Uh, Steelers-Jaguars, we had 12-22. to 22. Actual score was 20-10. to 10. Uh, Raiders Lions 16 to 29 actual score was 14 to 26 so again both of these sides within a field goal each uh, and the reason I show you that here is just to show you that the DVOA upgrades or the, the grades and the expected points have been very very accurate and it's been getting better and better and better uh, to begin this you know the, the part of the season where we start using these grades we had about seven to eight teams they were consistently being projected accurately. Now that has actually increased from seven to eight to currently 20. We have about 20 teams, which is roughly, let's just call it 62% of the NFL that's being projected within one standard deviation. One standard deviation is seven points. So roughly, let's, again, we'll just round it down. We'll say 60% of the NFL through this algorithm is being projected accurately within one touchdown. So definitely good, good to know. Uh, on the side here, if you see purple, that means that at least three weeks in a row we've projected the correct uh, or within, again, one standard deviation. Pink means within four weeks in a row we've projected. So, again, the Giants and the Raiders, both in pink, were pretty good at projecting these two teams. Now, I will tell you right now that the lower the scoring team is, 
the more accurately we can project it because we don't have as many variables. But that being said, pretty, you know, pretty good and it's going to continue to improve. So hopefully we get to like 24 or so is really what I would be shooting for. If we can project 24 out of 32 teams correctly, uh, we'll be able to make some nice sized bets. Um, just because we'll have more and more teams that we're accurately projecting that are going to be playing against each other that fall into the rest of our trends. Uh, so that is that portion of it. And let me see if there was anything else that we needed to talk about. Uh, differentials and totals. Uh, currently, we have 48% of the games landing between 1 and 7 points. And then we have um, 38 almost 39%, 38.5% of games landing uh, 14 or more points. So... What we're seeing this year compared to other years is more and more games being really, really tight or really, really big blowouts with only about 13% of the games landing within that like that two score range. So in the years past, that two score range, uh, basically like eight to 13 kind of range was 21% of the games, 25% of the games, 18% of the games. It was, you know, let's just say hovering around 20% of games were landing in that two score position kind of game now it's down to 13 percent. so if you see a bigger spread and you're you know certain that one team is going to win and not saying that you're always going to get it right but don't be scared off by a 10 and a half point spread or a 12 and a half or a 13 and a half point spread or even a 14 point spread uh, because more and more frequently we're seeing that those numbers between really 7 and 14 don't matter so much um, not to say that you're going to win every single time because you may just get the outright upset but the fact is, there's not a lot of games that are going to land on like an 11, right? Or a 9 or something like that. So just be aware of that. Uh, aside from that, there was one other item that I wanted to go over here. And I believe it was the three game homestands. Yep, there it is. So we have had three teams, actually, the three teams that have completed three game homestands. And then the fourth team just started, which is the Steelers. Some things to note about these three teams are for the four teams. So the Steelers, or the 49ers, I should say, won their first game. They actually went 3-0 and at home. The Steelers, the Browns, and the Rams all lost their first game at home. Now, I do think that that is standing, standing out a little bit to me, mainly because of the mentality behind being at home for three weeks. I think a lot of these players, and not just them, but their families, sort of take this as a vacation, right? Like a kind of as a reprieve kind of year, uh, part of the year. Because for the most part, these guys, you know, whether they're husbands or dads or brothers or whatever, they have other responsibilities. They're humans just like us. So if they are, you know, constantly like, I'm home this week, next week I'm in Arizona, then I'm coming home, then I'm going to New York, then I'm coming home, then I'm going to Los Angeles, then I'm coming home. It's harder. And if they have kids, if they have friends, family, whatever that they're, that they're taking care of, dealing with, you're constantly having to do that, especially the older players, like the veterans, the quarterbacks, right? The guys that are really going to make a difference they are going to be bogged down with you're here for three weeks you're at home for three weeks you need to be dad for three weeks you need to be you know son for three weeks you need to be whatever for three weeks and we know you're not going anywhere you're going to make plans we're going to do stuff we're going to take kids out we're going to do whatever it's 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 a mental thing so not to say that that's going to continue forever and ever and ever but that first week there's probably a lot of shit thrown on them right like imagine when if you if your wife or your girlfriend or whoever finds out you're gonna be home for three weeks what the fuck is she doing she's not like oh my god go have you know enjoy your time off no she's writing you a fucking list of this needs to get fixed and go do this and do this and drop off this and take the kids here and do this and that like it, it's human nature guys and so I, I again it's a small sample size but I, I do think there is something to that lastly the teams all of the teams is 4-0 when the team leaves home. We have 0-3 uh, record right now when the teams finally leave home. So obviously the Steelers just started their three-game homestand. They have not gotten to the end of it yet. But the previous three teams, the minute they left their, their facilities, they lost. Right? 49ers lost their game, Browns and Rams. Obviously Rams just lost to the Cowboys. Either way, though, just, uh, you know, not a good look and some of that is they're probably just again not focused a lot of this is going to come back down to mentality because there's not really a whole lot of other like oh like there's different play calling or anything because you're on the road this is just some of like a mental state and then lastly in week two all of these teams or the first three teams i should say are undefeated now the steelers i would say that they, they could continue that streak because there's a lot of things that are pointing the steelers way 
right? This is week two of a three-game homestand. So they should get the win if you're looking at the small sample size. They're also the home team playing on a Thursday night. And typically, if a home team playing on a Thursday night, if we expect them to end it over 500, they win that game 67% of the time. And really, they win even more than that. The only time that they lose that game or when they have that 33% chance of losing typically comes in in a divisional game. So this is not a divisional game. It's Thursday. I personally expect the Steelers to end up over 500 just because they've done so well so far this year and they've been dealing with a lot of injuries. Um, so And it's the second game of a three-game homestand. I would think that the Steelers are going to win this game, but because Pickett is fighting through an injury, we can't guarantee it. Uh, either way, though, even if they do win this game, like I said earlier, I don't see them winning by more than one touchdown. So give me the Titans plus the nine. But just a good, you know, trend here to keep your eye on is these three game homestands. Uh the Ravens are gonna start their three game homestand this upcoming Sunday. I know we have the Ravens, so we're going against this trend here. Um I don't really see, like I said, I think this is a ma- somewhat a case of mentality. I'm still going to take the Ravens to win this week over the Seahawks, uh, mainly because of the teams that have played. Again, I think they're the number one team in the NFL right now, but the only other team that's been as good as the Ravens is the 49ers that started that they won their first game. So another game did come earlier in the year, but I still think the Ravens are at least on par with the 49ers, if not better. So I'm still okay taking the Ravens for this week. And I believe... That is it. Let me see if there was anything else that I am missing here. Uh, Teaser week, guys. Again, it's still a teaser week, mainly because the lines are still sharp. They haven't gone anywhere. There's just more data now in the algorithm. And honestly, week 13 on, the only reason they're not going to be sharp anymore is from, and they will still be sharp. They're just going to be as sharp from week 13 because you have more and more rest advantages uh, starting week 13. And that's when the rest advantages tend to play a bigger role. Um, and here's a list of the games that are going to be impacted by that. When is I even wrote it down. Uh, so the rest advantage of three plus days from week 13 onward will result in the, the team with the advantage covering 55% of the time, 55.7% of the time, and the sample size is larger than 100 games. So in these games, we would expect this team to, with, with the advantage to win, or to at least cover, I should say, at least 55% of the time which means we're not going to take every single one of these, but if it's a good spot, we're definitely going to jump on that, Uh, especially, obviously, if the line is going to be in our favor. So that's the only thing that's really going to help us out come week 13 moving forward is the books typically don't take too much account into the, the rest advantage when it really it should increase your point value after week 13. So... That's pretty much it, guys, for today. If you have any questions, if there's anybody you want to know about, any team you want to know about, any expectations you want to know about, or if you want the spreadsheet for free, comment below. Find me on Twitter. It's at AG underscore sports 21. Just get in contact with me. With me, uh, Answer the questions. Give you guys a spreadsheet, whatever you may need. So thanks again. Hopefully this is a little bit shorter than usual. Y'all have a great day, and good luck out there. I'll see